Uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, we come before you as beggars. And we know this to be true. Uh, We have nothing uh, to commend ourselves to you, nothing in our own merits, nothing in our own intelligence, our strength, or our wisdom. But we come before you as beggars. And we plead the righteousness of Christ, our only hope. And Father, we thank you that you um, helped men to clearly see this truth, at times better than others that their only hope was Christ. Not anything they could add to their salvation, but Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. And we thank you for men like Martin Luther, who during this time of the church's history, uh, fought and sacrificed, and some even died for truths like these. We pray that you would help us also uh, to be grateful receivers and to be bold into passing down these things to our children, and to those who have uh, believed in Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we will begin um, our talk about the Reformation. Hopefully, you've got a lot of background now uh, from the medieval era uh, to help you understand why the Reformation is important, uh, kind of what leads to it uh, theologically, but also going on uh, in society as well. And I want to begin kind of jumping into about the year 1515. We'll look at our first slide here, and we're going to look at uh, a very beautiful church, uh, St. Peter's Basilica. St. Peter's Basilica was, uh, this is new St. Peter's, by the way. There was an old St. Peter's that was built uh, by uh, the Emperor Constantine, or begun by Constantine, uh, early on. And by the time of the Reformation, remember the popes had left Rome, and they were in France, or near France, in Avignon. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica was kind of in disrepair. So the popes, beginning in the 15th century, decided they wanted to rebuild it. Well, it drug on and drug on for about seven decades. And it was not getting built. It was not anywhere close to being rebuilt. Uh, And then some of the popes, like we talked about last week, the Renaissance popes, Julius II, for instance, he began to commission artists, began to get people that you know, like Michelangelo and Raphael, to design the architecture of the uh, new church, as well as make paintings and statues for the church. Uh, He didn't finish it. It was continued on. And In the year 1515, we have a pope. His name is Pope Leo X. He's from the Medici family. He um, begins to decide he wants to finish this thing. We need to get this thing done. It's not going to be finished, by the way, until like 1640 or something like this. Well, Pope Leo has got a problem. He needs money. Okay, so got that need in mind here. Um, We can go to the next slide. Um, There's another guy that we're going to run into here. Here's Pope Leo X. This guy's name is Albrecht of Mag- Magdeburg, or Albrecht, as you'll see in a minute, of Mainz. Okay? He is an archbishop. Got that? He also runs uh, a diocese in another area, so he kind of has bishop-like duties in another diocese. So he holds two pastoral offices. Okay? He is from a, uh, the Hohenzollern family, which is a very important noble family in Germany. But he also wants another archbishopric. <laughs> so he wants a third. He wants the archbishopric of Mainz. Now, this is a very very important territory in the Holy Roman Empire. There are seven regions that are designated electors in the Holy Roman Empire. Those seven electors, which would be represented by the elector himself, it could be a bishop or a prince, gets to vote on the next Holy Roman Emperor. His family already holds one of them. He would like this one. <laughs> that would give him two, okay, as well as a lot of money, revenue from having another archbishopric. Okay? So you can see we have the holding of multiple offices here. He's definitely not going to be able to do all these duties, so he's going to be an absentee bishop as well, some of the abuses we talked about. Well, he and Pope Leo get together with also, you may have heard of the Fugger bankers. I don't know if you've ever heard of them in history, maybe. Very, very wealthy bankers. They all get together and make a scheme. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, Albrecht's got to get money to buy this bishopric. The Pope needs money, so Albrecht says, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll make a donation to the new church building. But to help get some of these funds back, let's do this. Let's proclaim an indulgence sale in Germany. 
So Pope Leo says, great, we will declare an indulgence. We'll make all their indulgences that are going right now null and void. And the only one going on in Germany is this one that's connected and that you will run. Okay? So Albrecht, or Pope Leo publishes a bull saying there's going to be an indulgence. Albrecht gets to kind of oversee the campaign in his territory okay, in Germany. Now, foreshadowing a little bit here, there's going to be a Dominican friar named Johann Tetzel. Some of you may have heard his name. He will be the one in charge of kind of overseeing the preaching and the implementation of this indulgence, okay? But why is all this money coming in? A, to reimburse the, you know, some of these guys for their money, but also to help build what? St. Peter's Basilica. If you go to Rome today, go to the Vatican, you can go in and tour St. Peter's. It's a very, very beautiful church. And when I was there, I was kind of, you know, admiring all the beauty, but also at the same time realizing this is in large part what kind of gets things kicked off for the Reformation. It's not the sole cause, but it's kind of something that's happening in the background. Now, not a lot of people or anybody at the time, maybe a few people, knew about this deal between Pope Leo and Albrecht. Martin Luther did not know, as you'll see in a minute. But this is what kicks off, in many ways, the Reformation, is this sale of indulgences happening in the German territories. All right, well, let's now look at Martin Luther before the storm uh, breaks. So we'll begin by looking at his childhood and family. He's born in 1483 in Eisleben in the region of Saxony. There are two Saxonies, by the way. This is important. There's electorate Saxony, which has the power to do what? Elect the whole Roman Empire. Okay? Martin Luther later will live there and be protected by the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise. Okay? That's an important piece. Also, there's ducal Saxony, which is just another region of Saxony that's controlled by somebody of the same family, but who is a duke and not an elector. But he is born in Eisleben. He is the son of a copper miner. Now, we could have added in a really interesting piece about the, how the mining industry changed <laughs> a few le lectures ago, because uh, that does have a big impact on society. It helps Germany out, among other places. They become wealthy. They become at the center of a lot of uh, wealth, industry, and trade due to the changes that happen in the mining industry. And look here. Martin Luther's father gets involved. He's a smelter uh, of copper. He later will eventually, his family's um, kind of estates will rise. They're from the peasant class because his father gets in charge of seven smelting factories uh, and I think some mines as well maybe, uh, but he becomes more and more wealthy. Okay, they're technically the peasant class, but he's kind of trending upwards, okay? more and more wealthy. Because of this, he's going to be able to send his second son, Martin Luther, to school. Martin Luther will be the first of his family to be educated, uh, to become an academic, to get a university uh, degree. He will go uh, to the uh, University of Erfurt and get a bachelor's and master's degree. And then his father, and this is kind of important here, you can, this may plague Luther a little bit for the rest of his life. He wanted his son, Hans Luther wanted his son Martin to go get a law degree, okay? I mean, you want your son to go make a lot of money, right? Help out the family, take care of the family, okay? Last thing you want him to do is go get a humanities degree and get theology or philosophy, right? <laughs> um, well, Luther um, goes and begins to study uh, law at the University of Airfoot. And then on the next slide, we see that he uh, becomes a monk kind of suddenly. So after one month of studying law, he is walking through a thunderstorm. Okay, he's going from place to place. He doesn't have a car, of course, that don't exist. And it's storming. Okay? He'd also recently had a friend that had died, and he, like many other people in the time, as we talked about, had this great anxiety over their souls. Right? Where are we going when we die? Um, how, how long are we going to spend in the torments of purgatory? Right? All this kind of anxiety. Did I, did I confess all my sins? Did I do enough? Was I sincere? Okay? He has a friend die. That kind of mortality gets on his mind. He begins to think about it more. Well, this storm comes, and it frightens him. And if you've ever been caught outside, not just on your front porch, but outside in a bad thunderstorm, it's terrifying. Uh, and Martin Luther finds himself terrified. He throws himself on the ground, and he cries out to St. Anne, who, by the way, is Mary, uh, Mary, mother of Christ, mother, who's nowhere names ever recorded anywhere, but nonetheless, Catholics have created St. Anne, and now it's somebody you pray to. So nonetheless, there we go. He cries out to St. Anne, who uh, was also the patron saint of minors, and he asks her to save him, and if she does, he will become a monk. Okay? And that's a, a thing he's going to take very seriously. It's not just an idle um, oath. So he then goes to an Augustinian order of friars. Now, we talked about the friars. We talked about the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Well, we didn't talk about the Augustinian friars, but that's another group of friars, um, kind of like monks, but they engage more in the world. They live in the cities rather than being kind of apart from society. Okay? So he joins an Augustinian order of friars. 
Now, that will be very important because at this time, there are some people in the Augustinian order of friars who are trying to retrieve a very strong Augustinian understanding of salvation. Okay, and you'll see this in a, in a minute. But he's going to go there, and when he gets there, he begins to study not law, and his father, of course, is not excited about this, but he studies uh, theology. And here he's going to be introduced to um, Neo-Pelagianism uh, that comes from William of Ockham and Gabriel Beale, some kind of late medieval theologians. Now, wh- what does that mean? Okay? Uh, Pelagius taught essentially that man could, by his own nature, uh, essentially achieve merit and good works before God and have good standing. Okay? He didn't have to sin. Uh, if he sinned, it was because he chose to, not because he was born into sin. But you could, apart from grace in the sense that we would understand it, uh, achieve your salvation. Okay? Most people never go that far. And even in the Middle Ages, everybody knows that that is a big no-no. So everybody's always trying to nuance. say, well, we're, no, we're not Pelagian. Uh, so we're going to call this group Neo-Pelagians or, or Semi-Pelagians. Now, what did they teach? We talked about this uh, last or a couple weeks ago. They said, do what is in you. Or we might say, do the best you can. You do the best you can because remember at baptism for uh, Catholics, you are regenerated. You are essentially uh, infused with grace. So the idea is, listen, don't, don't worry about all this stuff. You do the best you can, and God's going to respect that and honor that. You just do the best you can. That was set up so people wouldn't worry so much, but it led to people you know, <laughs> worrying as well, right? Did I do enough? When I was in the confessional, did I confess all my sins? Because only the sins I confess are forgiven, okay? And you can't just go through the action of confession. You have to be contrite. You have to mean it, right? That's the technical teaching of the church. Um, was I sincere in my apology, right? You all know that, right? You've probably done something and it's sin or not and felt bad about it and confessed to somebody else. And you're like, did I really mean that? Or was I just trying not to get in trouble, right? Or maybe as a parent you think that more about your children, but nonetheless. Um, there's a, um, let's see, did I put it here? I think it's in the next slide. Oh, one more thing here. While he's in school here, this does become important. He begins to, and this comes through William of Ockham, distrust the use of philosophy, particularly of Aristotle. Late scholasticism has a huge reliance upon Aristotle and philosophy uh, to the point that uh, Luther and others see them saying what? You've essentially contained God and say that you understand everything there is about God. Um, and some of this later philosophy, I think it's unhelpful in a lot of ways, but at least on this point it's helpful by saying that, listen, God can't be contained by you know, your philosophies. Right? You don't understand God. Um, a lot of things we see in the Bible, like, we can't understand. Um, so we need to have what is our guide? Scripture. So that is a good, healthy, healthy kind of thing, antidote coming into some of the late scholastic developments. All right, well, let's go and look at Luther's anxiety. I think this is important to understand because we don't really understand the Reformation unless we understand that a lot of it is coming out of Luther's own personal anxieties over his soul. Okay? Uh, he's, in some sense, kind of trying to figure this out on his own and then... Apparently, it hits a chord with so many people that people resonate with what he's saying uh, and, and agree with, with this issue and with others. All right, so uh, the current teaching of the time was a merit-based system of salvation. You uh, receive grace, ultimately beginning with baptism and then through the other sacraments of the church, and then you do good deeds, acts of charity, in order to uh, gain merit so you can ultimately have good standing with God. Okay? Um, some of the things that would have been asked by people, uh, they would worry about, did I confess my sins? Was I sincere? And what if I failed to confess some of them? Um, n- notice, notice this. This is a, a, the quote I'm about to read is from a, essentially like a, something like a catechism that was published in 1470, and it was reprinted 19 times, or there were 19 editions before Luther. <laughs> so it was very popular. And this is essentially what, uh, I, I guess it would be read either by the, the priest during confession or something like this, but here's what it, would, it said. There are three things I know to be true that frequently make my heart heavy, so that make me sad. The first troubles my spirit because I will have to die. I know I'm going to have to die. That makes me sad. Understandable. The second troubles my heart more because I don't know when. Understandable, too. And look at the last one. The third troubles me above all. I do not know where I will go. So while the Roman Catholic Church technically taught if you were baptized in the church and you participate in the sacraments, you would ultimately end up in purgatory, which is ultimately to end up in heaven eventually, um, many people at the time began to even doubt that, right? Did I commit a mortal sin? And am I outside a state of a grace? Did I not confess that sin? Does that make sense? Because remember, mortal sins can put you outside of the state of grace and ultimately out of the grace of God and, and, and send you to hell if you do not repent of those sins. So people begin to get worried. There's no assurance of salvation for these people, okay? Or there's fear of what purgatory is going to be like. And if you read some of the descriptions of purgatory, it, the 
constantly the theologians saying, listen, I know you think it's better than hell, but listen, these fires are terrible here. The pains over here are terrible. Right? They're trying to say, don't take this lightly. You need to be pursuing holiness now, in other words. When he became a monk, he would spend hours in the confessional trying to confess his sins. I mean, hours. And he would walk out and realize he had forgot something, come back in and confess it. And the, the man that he confessed to is also kind of like his men, mentor. His name is uh, Johann von Stoppitz. I think that's my best German. Um, <clears throat> and he constantly tells him and, try, uh, and tries to teach him the Augustinian doctrines of grace. Listen, you can't do anything. This is all of God. You need to throw yourselves at the mercy of God. Okay? It's kind of very similar to what Luther is going to advocate later in, in many ways. He would even told you, as I mentioned the other day, Luther, actually go commit a sin. Go commit adultery. Go uh, kill your mother. Do something that's actually sinful. <laughs> right? Stop coming in here with all these petty things that really aren't sins. Okay? Um, he also told him, Luther, you hate God. And Luther later said, I think that was right. I hated God because when I thought of the righteousness of God, all I saw was God's condemnation on me because this was the bar, His righteous standard, and I could never meet it, and I was condemned. Okay? That's kind of how he thought about God, and, and stop it being a very good kind of cure of souls, looks and says, you hate God, and tries to help him kind of work through these things. Notice what he says about Stoppitz as well. Uh, he says, He was my first father in this teaching, and he gave birth to me in Christ. If Stoppitz had not helped me, I would have been swallowed up in hell and left there. There's probably a good joke. If he would have stopped it, he would have not been able to get help. Anyway, um, later Luther also looks back and talks about living in a monastery. He says, I kept the rules of my monastic order so strictly that I can say, if ever a monk went to heaven on account of his monkery, I don't think that's a real word, but I should get there too. If anybody was getting there, I did all the things. I, and he fasted, sometimes to the point of physical harm. Sometimes, by the way, this was a hallmark. There's a medieval, medieval theologian, Bernard of Clairvaux, that destroyed his body by fasting so intensely, and everybody kind of thought this was amazing. Uh, Bernard is an incredible guy. I don't necessarily know on that account, but nonetheless. Um, he would sleep at night with little uh, kind of warmth uh, on hard surfaces, trying to deny his body and trying to think of not earthly things but of heavenly things, trying to discipline his body through asceticism. Well, Stoppitz then realizes, listen, I've got to do something to help this guy out. He's so focused on himself and his sins, I've got to get him kind of turned outside and think about others. So in our next slide, we see that he becomes both a priest and a university professor. Stop it, sends Luther to Rome. That's in 1511. That's a very important kind of time. Luther goes to Rome, and he is just disgusted by what he sees, right? Uh, kind of the closer you get to Rome, the closer you get to hell, I think was uh, the gist of one of the sayings they had <laughs> at the time in, in, in Europe, in Italy. Um, there was lots of corruption there. He saw the pomp, the great wealth, and not a lot of holiness. He's kind of disgusted by what he saw there. Um, Stop it's also encouraged him to pursue a doctorate in theology, uh, in biblical studies, maybe more precisely, and Luther does. Luther holds several degrees, uh, and he's already lecturing kind of as a guest or junior lecturer at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, eventually, Luther's going to take over in the, uh, what do you call that, Department of uh, Biblical Studies in Wittenberg. And during that time, that's in 1513, notice what he lectures on. Psalms, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. So what is he doing? In this time, he's diving in very, very deep. By the way, he's using Erasmus's edition of the Greek New Testament that had come out. Uh, he's also reading other things around that time, looking at some of the later humanists or early humanist kind of commentaries on Scripture and things, like on the Psalms, for instance. So he's kind of, even though he's trained in scholasticism, he's kind of getting introduced to some of the humanist kind of teachings and works here as well. But he's working deeply through these. And if you know anything about the book of Galatians and Romans and Hebrews, those are kind of full-throated, particularly Romans, right, full-throated gospel kind of message, kind of man brings nothing to the table, but God has uh, given everything. Okay. Um, during this time, he, his understanding of justification begins to develop. You need to understand this. It is a development. Even when he nails the, uh, the theses on the door, there's nothing about justification by faith. That comes later. There's debate. Some people say early as 1513. Some people say as late as 1519. It doesn't necessarily matter for us all that much. But it's a development that you need to understand. It's not right away. The Reformation wasn't started because he says, oh, justification by faith. Let's, let's go to war over this. It's not. That's a later development, but early development. And will become the heartbeat, and Luther will say, this is kind of the linchpin on which everything hangs. If this falls, it all falls. But that's not now. Um, he later will um, be also elected or elected to serve as a priest at Wittenberg, and he will preach daily kind of to the people. So he has pastoral, he's preaching daily, 
By the way, he's also administering, I think, a, I put here, 11 other monasteries. He's kind of in charge of overseeing kind of the business affairs of things. At one point, he complains about having to get rent from a fish pond that's on one of the monastery's territories. <laughs> right? So he's got all these things. He complains, all I do is write letters all day. I don't have time to uh, do the daily offices and the hours going to the, the, where the monks would gather to say their prayers and read the scriptures. Um, so he's not able to do what? Focus a lot upon all this kind of guilt and things like this. But he's working through these things with all that in the background. All right, well, uh, I want to show you a couple pictures of, peop- of, of, of some people here. We have Frederick the uh, Wise. He's the elector of Saxony. He's going to be the guy who protects Luther, okay? I should say this. He has the largest relic collection, I think, in Europe or at least in Germany, okay? Tons. So he believes in relics of the saints and all this kind of stuff. And he sees the indulgence cell not so much as bad, but it's competition. <laughs> so he opposes it for totally different reasons. Also, when uh, the two Saxonies divided between Ducal and Electoral Saxony, the university was in Ducal Saxony, and his Saxony has no university. So he founds a young, very new university, I think in 1503-ish, Wittenberg. That's where Martin Luther will teach. So it's new. Martin Luther, again, he starts teaching there in 1514, about a decade after it begins. Okay? Uh, this is a painting from about 1540 of um, Wittenberg. Okay? This is the church. I'll show you a picture of it later where Luther will nail the 95 Theses. So that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Okay? And across this bridge, by the way, is the other Saxony. That's kind of important, maybe. All right. Well, let's look at what Martin Luther tried to do within the church. Let's go to the next two slides, and we're going to see he's going to begin as a reformer within the church with no desire to start a new denomination, to cause a rift in the church. He's like all the other reformers we have seen. Okay, he wants to stay within the church. Hey, I've got some objection. I think we could do some things better. Some things are off. Let's fix them. Um, but it's not going to go that way for him. All right, let's begin with Tetzel and the cell of indulgence. So remember the indulgence that was uh, proclaimed in Germany? Tetzel is a Dominican friar. Luther's an Augustinian friar. They have some conflicts, okay? They're not all, all in speaking terms sometimes, okay? Um, so just keep that in mind as well. He gets into the Wittenberg area. He's not allowed in. Why? Frederick says, you can't come in to my territories at all. So he can't come in, but what does he do? He sets up across the river in Ducal Saxony and begins to preach these uh, indulgences. He would essentially have hype men that would go into towns before, kind of like circus people that would go in before circus arrives and advertise, and they would begin to kind of get people worked up. Hey, there's indulgence cell coming, just get ready. And then Tetzel would come in. And he was known even by people who thought indulgences were good as being very sleazy and manipulative, Okay. A lot of people, even people that later on are going to fight Luther on indulgences, agree that he is abusive. Everybody likes to pile in on Tetzel, okay? So this is nothing weird that Luther is about to do this. Uh, notice uh, this is from an excerpt uh, that, uh, from one of his sermons. This is Tetzel. Do you not hear the voices of your dead parents and other people screaming and saying, Have pity on me! Have pity on me, for the hand of God hath touched me. We are suffering severe punishments and pain from which you could rescue us with a few alms. If only you would, open your ears because the father is calling to the son and the mother to the daughter. So just imagine you're kind of told that these indulgences will alleviate your time in purgatory or maybe even more. It seems that that was being taught at the time too, that you could even maybe escape purgatory completely or you could just get right into heaven, maybe in extreme cases. And you hear that in a society that even more than we do values family and, uh, and, and large units of family. Pull on your hearts. And notice, here's another kind of phrase he has. Luther quotes this in 95 Theses. He was known for saying, As soon as the coin in the money box rings, a soul from purgatory springs. It's kind of a jingle he had, right, as he would go through. Uh, He even said some very harsh things. He even said, Even if you violated the Virgin Mary, now think how important she is in Catholic thought, if you buy an indulgence, that will be forgiven too. I mean, pretty high up there. So he's pretty sleazy in a lot of ways. Um, Luther's parishioners, wanted to get these indulgences because they thought what? I can, by paying money, buy my salvation or or buy time out of purgatory or for my dead relatives. I can uh, shorten their time. Now, the official teaching of the church was not that you could go buy one of these and you're automatically forgiven. You could go buy one of these. You had to go confess to a priest and be contrite. You had to be sorrowful for your sins. That's the official teaching, but that's not what ends up happening. And Luther would have parishioners come back and saying things like, I've got my indulgence here. I don't need to come to Mass anymore. I don't need to go to confession. I don't need to do any penance. Why? I got my paper right here. See? You know, I'm out of my punishment for my sins. Okay? And Luther, as a pastor, remember, he's pa- preaching every day to these people. As a pastor, he finds this very problematic. Even though at the time, he 
does not have a problem with indulgences per se. Okay? So let's now look at the 95 uh, theses. Just a quick side note. This is a swan. I forget the exact quote, but Jan Hus, before he dies, essentially says that um, after me a swan will, or something like a swan will come, and Luther takes that interpretation to be whom? Himself. So he's the swan of the Reformation. And if you, a lot of Lutheran pulpits will have swans um, at the base of them to uh, reference that. But just aside. All right, so the 95 Theses, we all know about this, right? On October 31st, 1517, Luther posted or hammered very hardly <laughs> right, a, a set of Theses in Latin, it's important, for debate. Now, this has gotten blown up in, in, in kind of later on thoughts and things. I had a picture at the very beginning. There's like a whole mob of people with Luther, and he's like getting ready to nail them down. He probably, if he even did this himself, did it quietly by himself at night. Nobody was probably around except for people maybe walking up and down the street, okay? And also maybe in some of the pictures, the hammers get bigger and bigger and bigger, right, as the lore kind of grows, okay? But what is, what is the action that he's doing, okay? He does go post these on the door of the church. He posts them in Latin. Most people cannot read Latin. That's an educated person's game, okay, at the time. Why? This was the, the language of the universities, and you could go post theses, and that's what they are. They're just little statements, and we'll read some of them together. Uh, where well, he's saying, here's what I think, here's my opinion on this, and this, and this, and this, and they're very logical, and they flow together. And he posts them, all 95 of them, okay? And people would come look, and he says, I want to debate these 95 theses here on this day, okay? Now, interestingly, he posted a more controversial set of theses, 97 theses, a few months before, and they are more controversial, they kind of are more Augustinian, kind of ideas of grace, pushing back on a lot of what's going on. Definitely more controversial than the 95 Theses. 95 Theses are kind of just pretty much like, hey, I don't like the abuse of indulgences. Tetzel and all these people are abusing indulgences, right? Nobody pays attention to those at all. <laughs> so when Luther nails these on, he is not thinking, I'm about to get things, you know, blown up. I'm about to, you know, really rip the church apart. He's doing what is normal. You know, post these Theses, we'll have a debate, we'll see how that goes. Okay? Nothing controversial uh, so far. Very normal. And these uh, indul- uh, theses do mainly attack the abuse of indulgences. They do not attack the papacy. Uh, they do not attack the right use or correct use of indulgences. They do not attack the church's understanding of justification. That's not present in these theses. It's mainly the abuse of indulgences. On the same day, Luther also sends a letter to the Archbishop of Mainz. Remember the guy that was in with Pope Leo trying to get the indulgence preached? He sends him a letter on the same day with a copy of the theses, and I'll read you a little bit of that in a second, uh, essentially explaining what he's doing. Okay? Uh, and he's very humble, as you'll, as you'll see here in a second. Um, <clears throat> but what's going to happen with the 95 theses is they're going to get taken, copied down, translated into German without Luther's permission, printed in the printing presses. Remember those things? Those are kicking in at this time, and distributed all throughout Germany. And it's going to kind of overnight be like a bomb, but Luther had no intention of doing any of that initially. Uh, I'll read you first from the um, letter to the Archbishop of Mainz, just briefly. Just pay attention to Luther here in this first part. The grace of God be with you in all its fullness and power. Spare me, most reverend father in Christ, most illustrious prince, that's to Albrecht, that I, the dregs of humanity, have so much boldness that I have dared to think of a letter to the height of your sublimity. Skipping on down to some of his uh, obj- objections. Oh, good, oh God, most good, Thus souls committed to your care, good father, are taught to their death, and the strict account which you must render for all such grows and increases. For this reason I have no longer been able to keep quiet about this matter, for it is, no, it is by no gift of a bishop that man becomes sure of salvation, since he gains this certainty not even by the import grace of God, but the apostle bids us always work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. And Peter says, the righteous scarcely shall be saved. And Zechariah calls those who shall be saved brands plucked from the burning, and everywhere declares the difficulty of salvation. So notice Luther still has a somewhat of a medieval framework of understanding the all, uh, salvation. Why then do the preachers of pardons by these fables and promises make the people careless and fearless? Oh, I got my paper. I'm, I'm saved from all my sins now. He's saying they're made careless. Look how hard it seems to be able to get saved. Whereas indulgence confer on us no good gift, either for salvation or sanctity, but only take away the external penalty, which was formerly the custom to impose according uh, to the canons. That's probably enough there. He later goes on to advocate uh, people, rather than buying indulgences, should give alms to the poor. They should do acts of charity and love rather than trying to do this. Okay. Well, let's look at some of the 95 theses. Uh, we read one the other day, but I'll read it again. This is the first thesis. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of the believer to be one of repentance. Remember the misunderstanding of that text was do penance 
and that was used to justify the kind of sacramental uh, or the sacrament of penance. Next thesis, this word, uh, do, or repent, cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance. That is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Not that Lutheran necessarily has a problem with that, but he says that's not where you can justify it from. I'll read a few more. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God. So the Pope can't just, by fiat, say, you're, you know, declare people free of guilt. He can only do so when what? When God has declared them free of guilt. God remits guilt to no one unless at the same time he does what? Humbles himself in all things and makes him submissive to the vicar, the priest. Um, let's see. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as money clinks in the money chest, soul slides out of purgatory. That's to Tetzel. Those who believe they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers because they place trust in themselves and this piece of paper rather than in God. Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. Okay, so you don't have to have one of these, Luther's saying. You know, if you're contrite and sorrowful for your sins, you've gone through the uh, sacraments of the church, you're fine. Um, we'll leave that for now. Some of the later ones, though, he essentially says, and he tries to defend the Pope. He's like, and by what's being taught, how can we defend when they say this about you and this about you and this about you? But he's in some sense still affirming the papacy and it's a right to rule at this point. But he's objecting to the sale of indulgences. Okay? But why does this become such a big deal? It becomes such a big deal because some very powerful people have their hands in the money pot here and don't like it. Uh, particularly Albrecht of Mainz and then Pope Leo. Okay? And we'll see that in a minute. But that's largely why it's going to blow up. But also... Remember, all of that stuff we talked about in the late Middle Ages lecture is going on. This great angst of people is going on, but also a lot of people are upset at what? The corruption of the church, okay, or the lack of a spirituality in the church at the time. So many of the things Luther is saying is going to resonate with them. Let's go and look at the picture of the castle church in Wittenberg. So there it is, and there's the door. It was, the original door was actually destroyed in a bombardment, I think, in the 18th century. Uh, but this is the rebuilt door. There it is. And right there are the 95 Theses. Okay, all written down there. So if you go there, you can see them. But that is the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Well, let's look now at the spread and support of uh, Luther's Reformation. So again, without permission, the 95 Theses disperse throughout all of Germany and begin to be read, and they're eaten up. Okay, so over the, overnight, Luther becomes two things. He becomes the, the kind of the butt of attacks by many people, as you can understand, because he's really trying to, he stuck his finger into kind of part of the center uh, some of the central points of what? The medieval understanding of salvation. Uh, next, he also becomes what? The face of a reform movement. <laughs> it's like, this is our man. Luther's our boy, <laughs> right? Overnight, that happens. So who are some of his supporters? Well, the first group are humanists, like Erasmus. What Luther said so far is very Erasmian. Okay, at this point, Erasmus is like, yes, Luther's uh, saying what I've been saying in many ways. He's, I, I, Erasmus doesn't like indulgences either. He doesn't have a problem with them, like you can do them, but they're not the best. What matters is an internal what? Love of Christ, repentant heart, all that kind of stuff. That's what Luther's saying here. Um, but many other humanists also support this movement, so that's important. Humanists are going to be in his corner, at least early on. German nationalists. Many of the German nationalists, some of the German princes, look at what's happening in Rome by them bringing all this indulgence money out of Germany to where? To build a church in Rome. And this is not the first time Germany and Rome have had conflict. We talked about all those conflicts previously between the emperors and uh, the papacy. All that's been going on. Germany's weakened now. By the way, there are like 300 and something like princes or principalities, uh, duchies, towns, bishoprics that are all like ruling units, territories in the Holy Roman Empire. 300. <laughs> it's very fractured. And why is it fractured? Well, the Holy Roman Emperor's power was weakened by whom? The papacy. Okay? He was never all that powerful to start with, but the papacy really weakened him. So many German nationals see Luther as what? A German hero. He's fighting back against the Pope, who we've been fighting with off and on for a long time. And also just normal German Christians who um, want to see what? The church reform. They look around, they see lots of, you know, they see priests that are not holy and things like this and lots of abuses. They see people like the Albrecht of Mainz and others, and, and they want to see change. And also people that are struggling with all this anxiety that's going on and this kind of un understanding at the time. So what happens next is the Dominicans, and they've got some kind of recent wounds that have happened to their prestige, but nonetheless, they're not happy about some Augustinian friar kind of going at their boy, Johann Tetzel, here. So it's like a turf war now between the Dominicans and the Augustinian friars. So they appeal to Pope Leo, okay, and as well as Albrecht. Albrecht writes to Pope Leo, says, hey, do something about this. Um, 
Leo's like, I'm not concerned at all between some intramural debate between two groups of friars. I care less about this. It's not a big deal. Let me alone and build my church. Um, he does, though, tell the, uh, the prior of the Augustinian order, just stop this. Fix this. Uh, shut Luther up. Let's just move on. Not a, it's not a big deal. So Leo's not worried about it at all. It's not something we care about. Well, <clears throat> the next uh, stage kind of in the Luther story is he's kind of said all these things in the 95 Theses. He's written a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, but he is now summoned by his order. He's among friends to a disputation. And he's asked to be the kind of lead person in the disputation. You present the theses and we'll debate them. This disputation is called the Heidelberg Disputation. It's in April 1518. Uh, here he, does, he mainly pre- uh, presents his and defends his views of Augustinian uh, salvation as well as attacking kind of Aristotle's or the dependence on Aristotle and scholastic theology. I'm just going to kind of read some of these uh, to give you an idea of what's going on. In these 40 theses, he will say things like, our works are ultimately not good works, and they're not able to save us. Okay? So he will say something very kind of provoking, like, good, our good works are all evil. <laughs> and what he's saying there is, apart from Christ, these works do no good because we are in sin. Okay? Um, so he'll say things like that. He'll also um, our, he'll say, our intellectual ability tends to interpret things wrongly. How would we ever dream up things like a suffering Christ? Okay? That's not something if we're trying to use our intellect and our philosophy and all these things to figure it all out. Human-made religions don't come up with a God who comes down, takes on flesh, dies a cruel death on a cross. Right? That's just not something we uh, dream up. The suffering Christ and the cross turns all these things on their head. Kind of man's trust in himself and man's trust in his moral abilities as well as intellectual abilities. And the resurrection would tell us to hope even when there appears to be no hope. So a lot of times appearances are deceiving. Uh, a lot of times this is talked about as Luther's theology of the cross versus the theology of the glory, the theologian of the cross versus the, the theologian of glory. Uh, true Christians and theologians look to the cross where they see suffering. Okay, that's an important piece here. Where they see their works and ability to understand God come to nothing. Okay? Before God, you see the suffering Christ. Your best efforts, your best thoughts come to naught. They're, they're in vain. So what do we do? We must look to Christ, not to ourselves. He's looking at a lot of the philosophy that's coming out of the classic theologians, seeing them looking around saying, well, by my reason, I can determine that God exists. I can determine what God is like and what God would do in these situations. He's saying, no, 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 you can't. You're trusting too much in your own ability. You need to crucify those ideas and turn to Christ. So let's look at some of the theses on the next uh, page. I'm just going to read these. Um, the law of God cannot advance man on his way to righteousness, but rather hinders him. So God's law hinders man. Essentially, the law shows you that you're a sinner, in other words. Um, he then goes on to say, even by natural precepts or natural laws, those won't help you out either. Uh, later, free will, after the fall, exists in name only. And as long as it does what it's able to do, it commits mortal sin. In, in other words, we, our free will essentially does not choose good ever. It always chooses evil. Even if we do an externally good act because we are outside of Christ, we do an evil act. And if we do a good act... And then we say, look, I did a good act. I merited something. We become idolaters of ourselves, and this, therefore have committed a mortal sin, which takes us outside of the state of grace and condemns us to hell. That's kind of what he's getting at here. Okay? The person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him, there's that phrase, adds sin to sin so that he becomes doubly guilty. Nor does peaking in this manner give cause for despair. So after we said you can't save yourself, does that cause despair? He says No but for arousing the desire to humble oneself and seek the grace of God. So that's what all this should do. We talk about you can't earn your salvation, you can't be good enough. What should it do? Just cause us despair? No. Flee to Christ. It is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he's prepared to receive the grace of Christ. And here's the kind of very famous, famous phrase. He does not deserve to be called a theologian who sees the invisible things of God understood through those things that have been made. So the man that uses his own intellect and reason. But he deserves to be called a theologian who understands the visible and back parts of God seen in what? Suffering and the cross. He is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. The law says do this and it is never done. Grace says believe in this and everything is already done. You can already see there kind of the development towards justification by faith and and things like this. And then well, how do we get there then? Notice this. If we can't do anything good on our own, our free will only chooses evil. How does this happen? He's going to invoke essentially some, uh, what we'd understand as predestination here, that God is going to begin to move towards us and cause us to uh, love Him and turn to Him. The love of God does not find 
but creates that which is pleasing to it. So God doesn't look out and say, oh, you're doing good works, you're pleasing to me, but he does what? He creates it in us. The love of man comes into being through that which is pleasing to it. He who wishes to philosophize by using Aristotle without danger to his soul must first become thoroughly foolish in Christ. So those are the Heidelberg disputes there, and you can see his kind of understandings of salvation beginning to come more full-throated. Well, then we go to the Leipzig debates. Uh, these are uh, very important debates. Um, I might skip some, some of the background here, but I will say this because I think it's really fun. Leipzig was the university in Ducal Saxony. Wittenberg is the university in uh, uh, Electoral Saxony. Well, the, uh, Johann Eck challenges um, Luther superior uh, Karl Stott to a debate because he can't, you have to challenge the most uh, high ranking professor. So Luther, Karl Stott, and Melanchthon, another reformer, they all get together and they go out, and all the students come. And it's like, I mean, I don't know, gangs of New York, kind of like a you know, street dancing crew type thing where everybody's got, you know, acting all tough and stuff like this. Some of the students are wearing swords and they're walking in, you know, at night with their torches. I mean, it's like, you know, we're coming to throw down. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a big deal when they come in for this debate and they don't like each other. Okay? It's, you know, this university over here and us, we're enemies. Also, the university at Leipzig had been a big opponent of Jan Hus who was burned at the stake by the Council of Constance. And now these guys who are essentially teaching what Jan Hus is teaching, coming in. I mean, it's kind of like big in your face kind of stuff. All right. Anyway, there's some other interesting background stuff we'll, we'll skip for time's sake. Okay, so they get in this debate. Long story short, Johann Eck is known as being a great debater. I think maybe Eck means corner. So there's a kind of a, I may be wrong about that, but there's a kind of a joke that Johann corner backed Luther into a corner, or Johann Eck backed him into a corner, nonetheless. Not as that funny, maybe, but um, <clears throat> what, what corner does he back him into? Long story short, he gets him to admit that he is teaching what Jan Hus taught, and a lot of other things that you've seen probably overlap a little bit. Okay, so Luther, and he's almost said as much the night before at a, at a sermon. And then when he admits that, Luther had been appealing, he said, he, at this time he'd been saying, the Pope is not the only one that can call a council. He's not the supreme authority. He can be checked by councils and by scripture. Well, now Eck gets him to say, okay, a council who you think can't err condemned Huss. What, and that's what you teach. So do they have authority? And then Luther is forced to say what? Councils as well as the Pope can what? Err. Our only infallible authority is Scripture. So that's kind of the big debate that, or the conclusion we get to in there. I think it's at this ba- debate that he, at this point, maybe it's in another one, but he will at some point say, I'm terrible German here, and I'm going to leave out some words, but Ich bin Hussite. I am a Hussite. <laughs> in German, not in Latin. It's important for all this German nationalism stuff that's kind of going on in the background. Well, that gets us to our first kind of uh, canon or, or sola of the Reformation, uh, sola scriptura. So let's briefly talk about what sola scriptura is. Remember, there are five of the solas. This is the first one. Uh, here's a definition from one of those books I recommended to you earlier. Uh, This is from Matthew Barrett's God's Word Alone. Only Scripture, because it is God's inspired Word, is our inerrant, sufficient, and final authority for the church. Now, let's make sure we understand what this does mean and does not mean. I'd say in a lot of evangelical circles, this is not properly understood. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that there are no other authorities with which we can benefit from and use. Okay, Uh, Those other authorities would be things like the creeds. They're very beneficial. The church has passed those down, and we should use them. Uh, a lot of the church fathers, the theologians, all throughout church history are other authorities. They're men who studied the Scriptures, knew the Scriptures, wrote about the Scriptures, uh, devoted their lives to trying to do this. Um, those are authorities that we can use and benefit from. Okay? Catechisms that we've passed down throughout church history, which really get going around the time of the Reformation uh, big time. Uh, all these things like that are authorities. Uh, your, your pastor would be an authority, or, or you can start multiplying several things here. Older members in the church that have walked with the Lord a long time are an authority, okay? What does it mean, though? It means that any of those authorities I just mentioned and others like them can err and always stand under the judgment of what? Holy Scripture. And if they say anything out of line with Holy Scripture, then their authority is superseded by a greater authority, the final authority of Scripture, Okay? So we should and could benefit from all these other resources. Uh, it's very foolish to try to think that you can, by yourself, without any help, I think it's actually impossible because you're always being taught things, 
uh, by your parents, by people in the church, so it's probably impossible. But it'd be very foolish to say, I just have my Bible, and I'm going to figure it all out. Okay? Some of this stuff is very tough sledding, right? Uh, a lot of it's very easy to understand. Uh, I think a good maybe metaphor here would be that the, that the Scriptures are like a kind of wading pool, or like a body of water, and one end you can, you can splash in and play in and never worry about drowning. But then if you go a little bit further, you would drown in because it's so vast. You'd never reach the bottom of it, right? So you get both those things. A child can come and play and splash in it, but you can spend your whole lifetime and never ever see every corner and inch of it, okay? Um, so it doesn't mean we have no other authorities. It just means that Scripture is the ultimate, final, and sufficient authority, okay? Everything we need is here. It's sufficient, um, and it's able to be interpreted, too. The Roman Catholic Church say, well, it's not clear, and you need what? Therefore, the church's magisterium or the church's teaching to tell you what it means, and you must submit to the church's teaching on certain matters. Uh, the Reformers say that, no, the, the Scriptures are clear, and they can be interpreted and understood by everybody, the laity as well. And they're going to begin to write Scripture in the vernacular. Okay? All right. Um, I'm going to skip that next part. Um, I'll explain what it is in case you want to look at your notes. Uh, there are three different kind of traditions here. One we call the Catholic tradition, one the mainline reformer tradition, and the last one would be the radical reformers. The mainline reformer tradition is probably the, the best expression of sola scriptura or understanding of scripture. Let's go on to the next uh, sola that we have. This will be the last one we do for this lesson, and that is sola fide, justification by faith. Uh, Luther, uh, through the help of Philip Melanchthon, begins to understand that the Greek word that means uh, to justify uh, doesn't mean to be made righteous or to make righteous, uh, but it means what? To be declared righteous. There's a big difference. So the Roman Catholic idea would be what? That you're infused with grace at baptism, and then God is doing what? He is putting grace in you, and you're doing good works, and you're being made righteous. The Protestant understanding of justification by faith would say this, that upon believing in Christ by faith, God then looks at you, and you've been united with whom? Christ by faith. And you, He has taken your sins on His own body in the cross, and you have received His righteousness, this imputation. It's being counted to you. And He looks upon you and sees not your sin that still does exist in you. You still struggle with sin, right? But He sees Christ's righteousness. And you are declared in that moment righteous. And you can be assured that on the day of judgment, that declaration that was proclaimed today when you believed will be proclaimed then as well. Okay? It's very different than the Roman Catholic understanding that's going on at the time. But Luther begins, and he reads the uh, verse. This is kind of his breakthrough, Romans 1.17. The righteousness of God is revealed. Okay? And when the righteousness of God is revealed, he, he at first has a tough time understanding that. He's worried about that, being God's judgment over him. But he begins to see it what? Is God's righteousness being given to him. Because how do the righteous live, according to Romans 1.17? By faith. So he has this breakthrough, realizes that we are justified, we receive right standing with God by faith at that moment, and we are justified. Um, also, a very important thing here is justification in Roman Catholic theology and sanctification, as we understand it, are one thing. Okay? You're being justified as being made holy. We would separate them. Justification is the declaration of being righteous. Sanctification is in the rest of your life. Seeking to rely upon God, just as you relied on Him for salvation, to make you holy, to do good works, to love God, to love your neighbor, all those things. And throughout your Christian life, you should be advancing and pursuing holiness uh, to some degree. We would call that sanctification. Roman Catholic theology knows no distinction. It's one thing for them. Okay? So big difference there. Now, this undercuts the medieval understanding of all these things. Right? If you, by faith alone, can go to a priest, there's no need of all the sacraments, and at least the sacramental system that they have set up. Okay? Uh, you don't have to go now to a priest to confess your sins. You can confess them to God. So it kind of removes all these intermediaries, these saints that have come into play, uh, the, even some of the role of the priest here as well. Those are kind of removed and taken out. Well, let's look now at uh, Luther outside the church. We're going to look at his excommunication. Uh, in 1520, Pope Leo sends out a, what's called a papal bull called Exurgiae Domine, which means rise up, Lord, or rise up, O Lord. Um, and what does this uh, document say? It essentially says, Luther, you have 60 days. Here's all the errors you're being charged with. You have 60 days to recant of these opinions, or you will be declared a heretic. Okay? Luther gets this papal bull, uh, and he holds on to it for a while. And eventually, <laughs> he will take it, and he will get all his students together and all his buddies, and they will have a big bonfire in which he will throw the papal bull into the fire. And then a month or so later, a few months later, 
he then is officially declared a heretic. Because by burning it, he's saying, what? I'm not going to answer any of these charges. Um, and at this time, his theology begins to develop and become a little more uh, solidified. Uh, what is he charged with? Denying papal supremacy? Denying the Pope's ability to excommunicate from the true spiritual church? His desire, like Jan Hus, to give the, uh, the cup when they take communion to the lady as well as the bread. Not just the bread, but the cup and the bread. And the teaching that free, the fall destroyed free will. Those are some of the things that he is charged for. Not, again, justification by faith. That's not, not brought up here. But as you're saying, that's becoming more and more important. So January 3rd, 1521, he is now a heretic. Now, the church never executes anybody in history, okay? The church does not do executions. Who bears the sword? The state. So what would happen in this time was he's been declared a heretic. That now is turned over to the state who will then try him. They're not going to try him on theological grounds. That's already been done. They will now try him to see if, if he needs to be executed, okay? So that's where we go next. Um, and he's going to be summoned to um, the Diet of Worms to stand before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Okay? Now, I'm going to have to leave out a slide because we're running out of time, but um, if you want to understand some of the important writings, look at the next slide, the clearly formulating his theology slide. Uh, there are three of his most important works that are written early on, and I'll give you kind of an idea of where some of his thought is going. Let's go to the Diet of Worms. All right, so... Uh, Charles V is the new Holy Roman Emperor. He's only been elected about a year or so ago, and he's younger than in this picture. <laughs> um, and he demands Luther appear before him, just like Emperor Sigismund demanded Jan Hus appear before him at the Council of Constance. And at that council, if you remember, they said, we'll give you safe passage. Well, they tell Luther what? You can have safe passage. Didn't work out so well for Hus. And there's some technicalities of why so, but Luther goes. There's a lot of courage here uh, in going. He knows what? If I go and they try me, there's a good chance that what? Most likely, I'm dead. I'll be burned alive, right? It's a punishment of heretics. So he arrives in April, and he stands before the council, okay? And another Johann Eck, not to be confused with the other Johann Eck, I wish they would diversify their names a little bit, but nonetheless. Uh, he essentially had a whole table of Luther's writings, some of the ones that were in the last slide, and he says, Luther, did you write these works? And Luther says, yes, I did. Uh, then he says, Luther, do you recant all that is written in these works. They're not even going to debate what? The merits of his works. They're not going to debate the subtleties of his work, his objections. Why? To them, that's already been decided by whom? The church. So that's not what they're here to do. So it may look like a kangaroo court, but it's not necessarily a kangaroo court. They're just saying, okay, you, you've been condemned to this. Do you recant them? If not, we're going to burn you. Okay? Luther then very heroically says, can I have one day to think about it? <laughs> okay? So he goes home. And he spends a night of anguish. I mean, this, you guys need to understand, this is a big deal, right? He's going to be, I mean, he is, and some sense, already cast out of the church. I mean, even though he's kind of developed in his theology, what he had known before and what had been taught a long time before was to be outside of this church was what? To not have salvation. I mean, this is a big deal, okay? Luther knows, also, I could be burned alive. That's weighing on his mind, too. But also, he begins the question. He says, am I alone right? Why does, is nobody else seeing this? And the answer is, yes, they are. People are, are buying into this, but am I alone right? And just think about the anguish. So he begins to pray. He begins to read the passages that helped him to come to this understanding, and he determines, I cannot recant. So he goes the next day before uh, Johann Eck, and Johann Eck does the same thing. These are worked. Yes, uh, do you recant them? Luther initially says some things like, well, there's some of these are devotional writings, some of these are this kind of writing, some of these are against personal people. What would you like me to, to, to you know, reject here? Some people like some of the things I wrote, by the way, just FYI. I know I was a little harsh sometimes, but besides that, what do you want me to actually deny? And they permit, say, no, everything, deny it all. And then Luther says this, unless I am refuted and convinced by testimonies of Scripture or by clear reasons, so there's the idea of Sola Scriptura, okay, coming out there. Since I believe neither the popes nor the councils by themselves, for it is clear they have often erred and contradicted themselves, which is true. I am conquered by the holy scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not withdraw anything, since it is neither safe nor right to do anything against one's conscience. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. Uh, he is then condemned in May as an outlaw now. That means anybody can grab you and kill you. And as he's late, he's like, well, I'm going to get out of town. So he gets out of town as quick as he can. And as he gets out of the city, he goes near a wood. And these knights, these men on horseback, ride up and grab him. Now, I don't know if he knew this was happening or not, but these are some of Frederick the Wise's men who had been sent to capture him. And Frederick said, you do not tell me where you're going to place him. I don't want to know. 
but go save him. And they take him to a castle, and that's our next slide, the Wartburg Castle. Okay? So he's essentially been captured. And Frederick can always deny when the, when the uh, Holy Roman Emperor Charles is like, hey, where's Luther? He's like, I have no clue. <laughs> right? Um, he actually hides him in, in Ducal Saxony, not in Electoral Saxony. But anyway, there is the Wartburg Castle that he stays at. Okay? He spends 11 months here. He grows out a beard. He lets his tonsure grow back, kind of throwing back his monasticism uh, a little bit there. Uh, he takes on the name of Junker George, or Sir George, um, and he goes around you know, asking, you guys know where Martin Luther's at? <laughs> Just trying to play, play dumb, I guess, in some ways. But here he does some important things. He here begins to write to people who are part of the movement. He begins to respond to critiques of his theology. He also does something very, very, very important. He translates the New Testament into German using Erasmus's uh, Greek New Testament, which he's not a great Greek student, but Erasmus has his own Latin translation, so he can kind of triangulate and translate there. Okay? Uh, we're not going to talk about what happens next until next week, but he's going to have to leave Wittenberg because th- or Wurtburg because things in Wittenberg get off the rails a little bit, and he has to leave and flee his safety in the castle and go deal with those. But let's look now at the life of Martin Luther. And if you see this next slide, you can see uh, Junker George there with his beard, a little bit different than he's looked before. Um, I'm going to skip the next slide too, family life and, and the value of vocation. Luther does get married to an ex-nun. And they do have uh, six children together. Uh, they have a very sweet marriage. Uh, I wish we had time to spend a whole class talking about their marriage. Um, he also will teach about the importance of family life. Uh, the celibacy was upheld as the pinnacle of holiness. He says, no, the married life is an honorable uh, vocation as well. You should seek it, pursue it. Motherhood, fatherhood are valuable vocations. Also, he holds up all vocations. Leaving the world and living in monastic isolation is not more holy than what? Living in the world, being a farmer or being a miner, right? You can do all these things to God's glory. So he raises the, the um, idea of, of vocation. Well, let's look at the death of Luther, and then we'll, we'll end today. In 1546, Luther's 62, 63. He takes a long journey, uh, 80 miles or so, uh, and he takes sick, gets a fever. And during the night, he recites as he's kind of laying at home. He finally does make it back home. He keeps reciting Psalm 31.5, Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord of truth. And a friend will ask him, Father, a reverend father, will you die steadfast in Christ and the doctrine you have preached? He responded, yeah, or yes. And he died by the morning. But a note was found on his desk by his bedside, and it said this, Nobody can understand Virgil in his bucolics or gorgics unless he has first been a shepherd or a farmer for five years. Virgil wrote some pastoral poetry. He's saying, if you have not been a a shepherd, you can't in, in, in understand the pastoral or shepherd poetry. You had to do it for five years. Nobody understands Cicero in his letters unless he's been engaged in public affairs of some consequence for 20 years. Let nobody suppose that he has tasted the Holy Scriptures sufficiently unless he has ruled over the churches with the prophets for a hundred years. Therefore, there is something wonderful, first about John the Baptist, second about Christ, and third about the apostles. Lay not your hand on this divine Aeneid, but bow before it. Adore its every trace. Talking about the scriptures. And then he says this, we are beggars, it is true. Right? Um, go to the next slide, and we'll, uh, I'll read a couple quotes here, and then I'm going to read from a book, and we'll be done. Um, Luther said this, in short, I will preach it, teach it, write it, but I will constrain no man by far, force, for faith must come freely without compulsion. Take myself an example. I oppose indulgences in all the papists, but never with force, This is my favorite Luther quote. (laughs) I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. All I did was preach the word, be faithful to the word. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip and Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. I was sleeping and drinking at the pub with my buddies, and the word did it all, accomplished all its power. And I'm going to read you a little bit here from Timothy George's book, and we may be a little bit over, but I think it's, it's a worth the read. Luther's whole approach to the Christian life is summed up in these last words. We are beggars. That is true. The posture of the human vis-a-vis God is one of utter receptivity. We have no legs of our own on which to stand. No mystical ground of the soul can serve as a basis of our union with the divine. We are no merits that will purchase for us a standing before God. We are beggars, needy, vulnerable, totally bereft of resources with which to save ourselves. For Luther, the good news of the gospel was that in Jesus Christ, God had become a beggar too. God identified with us in our neediness, like the good Samaritan who exposed himself to the dangers of the road to attend to the dying man in the ditch. God came where we were. 
We have spoken of Luther's uh, depression or struggle, his struggles with the devil, and the spiritual onslaughts that pursued him throughout his life. In such moments, Luther found the grace of God most sustaining. I did not come to my theology all of a sudden, but had to brood ever more deeply my trials, my suffering. Remember the, theology, the theologian of the, of the cross? But had to brood over it more deeply. My trials brought me to it, for we do not learn anything except by experience. Luther also wrote, one has never su- suffered cannot understand what hope is. Luther once remarked that his insight into the gracious character of God had come to him while he was off the ser cloca, literally on the toilet. While some scholars interpret this saying in terms of Luther's acute suffering from constipation, we know that the express in cloaca was a common metaphor in medieval spiritual writings. It referred to a state of utter helplessness and dependence on God. So it doesn't mean literally what it says it means is what they're saying. Where else are we more vulnerable, more easily embarrassed, and in Luther's mind, more open to demonic attacks than when we are in cloaca? Yet it is precisely in a state of such vulnerability when we are reduced to humility, when like beggars we can only cast ourselves on the mercy of another, that the yearning for grace is answered in the assurance of God's inescapable nearness. Time and again, Luther proved the truth of this statement in his own experiences. When shut up in the Wartburg, the devil was so real that he could hear him flipping chestnuts against the ceiling at night. When he was haunted by the demon of self-doubt and faced with the question, Are you alone wise? When his body was racked with illness and pain, when the church was besieged by war and plague from without, by heresy and schism from within. One of the lowest points of his life was when his beloved daughter, Magdalena, barely 14 years of age, was stricken with a plague, brokenhearted, and Luther knelt beside her bed and begged God to release her from the pain. When she had died and carpenters were nailing down the lid of her coffin, Luther screamed out, Hammer away! On doomsday she'll rise again. Luther had really said it all along before. In his explanation of the fourth of the 95 Theses. This is the last paragraph. If a person's whole life is one of repentance and a cross of Christ, then it is evident that the cross continues until death and thereby to entrance into the kingdom. Luther's legacy, unlike that of Francis, does not lie in the saintliness of his life. His warts were many. His vices sometimes more visible than his virtues. Nor does his legacy depend ultimately upon his vast accomplishments as a reformer and a theologian. Luther's true legacy is his spiritual insight into the gracious character of God in Jesus Christ the God who loves us and sustains us unto death, and again, unto life. What else is Luther, asked Karl Barth, than a teacher of the Christian church whom one can hardly celebrate in any other way but to listen to him? All right, you're dismissed.